The other key thing with this is with other assessments, such as the DISC or Myers-Briggs and things, you can, it's really easy to put someone else in that box and to go, oh, you're obviously an I because you're fun loving and all the things. They warn you in the introduction of this book, do not do that because the Enneagram is not about all of your external features, all of your external things, your characteristics. It is all about your motivation, why you do the things that you do. And you can't pick that out of somebody else. Hey friends, it's Mary. And this is The Mary Jervich Show, a podcast that champions today's working women to gain the clarity, confidence, and courage to up-level your career while strengthening your faith and living your dream life all in record time. We'll cover topics like career advancement, leadership, personal development, faith, and health and wellness so you can intentionally create a career and life full of more abundance, joy, and love. Let's get started. Hey friends, welcome on in to this episode of the Mary Jervie Show. I am over the moon, just so incredibly ecstatic about today's conversation. We have a very special guest on with us and she's going to help us open up the topic of talking about the Enneagram. If you've never heard of the Enneagram or maybe you have dabbled with it a little bit, then you do not want to miss this episode. We're gonna be diving in deep. And I have to tell you, learning and understanding the tool that we're gonna be talking about today was life-changing for me, incredibly life-changing. I'm sure we'll get more into the story, but not only did it change my personal personal life, improved my marriage, but it improved my relationships at work and it allowed me to de-stress. So I am like just so incredibly excited about this topic because it has had life-changing results for myself and the clients that I've worked with in using this. But our guest today, she is a coach, a wife, a mom, and an author. On the Enneagram, she is an eight with a seven wing. You'll learn more about that in just a few minutes. You're like, what is that? She is an entrepreneur. She loves to travel and she loves efficiency. Our guest, Kylie Robinson, loves to live her life on purpose. She wants to work together with people so they can be more efficient, live out their values, and pursue a life they love. Welcome in, Kylie. Thank you so much, Mary. I'm so excited to be here with you. Wow. I I cannot tell you how thrilled I am. I think that's probably already come across. So let's go ahead and dive on in. I'd love for you just to start with just telling us more about you, who you are and, you know, why the Enneagram or how the Enneagram kind of came into your life. Yeah, definitely. So as you said, you know, I am an executive coach. Um, I focus on helping people with goal setting and vision. I've always been I, I've kind of joked that entrepreneurship runs through my veins. Like I'm a terrible employee <laughs> and and that I've learned thanks to some of the Enneagram stuff is like, that's okay because that's who I am and I don't need to fit into this certain mold. Um, so that's kind of, you know, where I go with it. But it, it, the Enneagram has really like been able to guide a whole lot of direction that I've taken and understand who I am and how I work with people. And so that's what I love uh, sharing with other people, you know, you need to discover who you are. You need to dig into this and really tap into that self-awareness so that you can work better with other people. And there might be things that you like and dislike about yourself. And there may be reasons for some of those things. And so the Enneagram really helps understand a lot of that and really give yourself some grace. Because I know us, you know, as women, we're really good at beating ourselves up. And anything that can get provide us with a little bit of extra grace and understanding can be life-changing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about the Enneagram. Like what, what is the Enneagram? If somebody is listening, they're like, this is just a strange word. What is this? What does this mean? You said eight with a seven wing. What, what does this mean? What are these crazy numbers? Yes. <laughs> I yes. know I've had people be like, what is that pentagram thing? I'm like, no, 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 no. This yeah. is very different. <laughs> um, the Enneagram that if you're a reader, there's a couple of different books you should definitely get into. And the first one is by, uh, I believe he was a monk or a reverend or something. And it's Dr. Richard Rohr. And he has like kind of the first book on it, but really the Enneagram is the first personality test that we are aware of. So it it dates back, I want to say 1600s. It's very old. And so it's not, it's not this crazy made up newfangled thing. This has been around for a really long time. And if you've done any kind of personality tests and things, this one gives you the most wiggle room. This one doesn't put you into a box. So in my life, I have looked into Myers-Briggs. I've done the DISC assessments and Personality Plus and Navigate, all these different tests and things that give you a piece of you know who you are. But most of them have four options. The Myers-Briggs, I believe it breaks it down to 16. But 
it's still it's still four pieces that they're giving you and that's it and so the danger with that is it puts you in a box and doesn't allow for growth or for stress or where you are in maybe a season of your life whereas the enneagram gives you that the enneagram you have this is your number but then you have a wing and your wing is going to be one of these numbers that's beside you so if you're a two your wing can't be a seven your two has to be a one or a three, or your wing has to be a one or a three. So you've got those, but then you also have these different numbers that you point to whether you're in a space, you know, mentally or physically in a space of health or stress. And you can go, oh, now I re realize that because I'm in this stressful situation, I'm pointing to and I'm acting out with more characteristics of the eight, or I'm in a really healthy place. I, you know, I'm a healthy and my number is just really healthy. I'm really good at my number. So I actually display a lot of the characteristics of the two, you know, whatever it might be, you know, wherever your numbers are going. So that's the beauty of the Enneagram is it gives you all these different options and a lot of wiggle room and places that you can kind of mesh into depending on where you are in life instead of saying, nope, this is who you are, period, said and done. Yeah. And it, and the tool for me, it really, you know, it is an assessment. It's a tool. It's just a way for us to gain a better understanding about how we're already operating. And for me, it was just super life-changing because when I took this assessment and first I, I read this book, so I didn't even take the assessment. I read a book and that's how I discovered which type I was. The, the book was The Road Back to You. And the unique thing about it was I was sitting at this dinner and I had been recommended to read the book, but I didn't read the book. And here everybody was talking about, well, my number is this and my number is this. And it's so accurate. And everybody was so excited. I'm like, oh, I should have read the book. Why didn't I read it? So right away I started reading it. And as I was reading it, they say like, you will know, you will just know when you have come upon your number, your type. And what it does in the book is it really just is talking about thoughts that you have, ways that you process things and ways that you think about things. And these are already the things that are running through your mind. It's not necessarily the things that are coming out of your mouth, but these are the things that are running through your mind, kind of that self-talk that we have. And when I heard it, I was like, oh my gosh, that is me. All right. I was a number one on this thing, but it's so unique what you just said, because I thought here I was a number one, the perfectionist, and maybe we could go through all the different numbers so people can understand what they are. And I was like, oh no, I'm a number one. And I texted it to Dr. Kai, the person that had recommended me to read the book. And he was like, no, it's great. It's great. Right. But who wants to be the perfectionist? But it's unique, as you said, because yeah, we, we can have these wings, but we also have when we're healthy and when we're unhealthy in a situation, and one of the things I realized is, oh, actually you can be a seven, but if you're a super stressed seven, you can actually show up as a one. And I learned that far down the road and I'm like, I think I might just be a seven that was in a really crazy stressful place whenever I took this assessment, I may actually be a seven. And so the thing is, is it's like, it doesn't hold you. And I love what you said about that because it doesn't put you in this box. It doesn't hold you to this place, but not only does it help you to understand like, Hey, these are the thoughts you're having. But the thing that was really opening for me and really helped to kind of free myself of this perfectionism at the time was to realize everybody else isn't thinking the same way I am. Well, here I was thinking like, oh, we all have these thoughts, but really very few people were having the exact same thoughts I was having. And what that did for me was allow myself to realize like, people aren't thinking this way. If they're not thinking this way, then A, I can give myself a break. I don't have to be perfect for one. And B, if people aren't thinking this way, they're thinking in these other ways. Well, then I can't expect them to be thinking and doing the same things I am. Like clearly they don't see and process the same way. And that's what really opened it. So I'd love to hear about your experience. How did you get introduced to the Enneagram? Yeah, I want to add to what you were saying. The one has that inner critic. And I... I think I'm fairly critical of myself. And like I said before, I think women, like we, we do a really good job of beating ourselves up. But when you learn the Enneagram, the one that inner critic is like off the charts. Like I can't relate to it when I, my, my husband's a one as well. He's a one wing nine. So I can understand a little bit. And so when he starts, when we learned about the Enneagram and he starts dishing all this stuff out, I was like, you're insane. <laughs> like, this is so hard on yourself. <laughs> And, but he does so good in what he does. So it's a, a matter of taking that. And like you said, being able to back off a little bit and say, it's okay. Not everyone is thinking this way. And I can, it can allow you to have more grace on other people as well as yourself and let up. Yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. That That's exactly it. Because once I started to understand, okay, I'm processing in this way. And I looked up a graph at the time and it said only 1% of people were ones. And so this is the, the understanding I was operating under. So I was like, okay, my husband was right. I'm really not like anybody else. Here I was, <laughs> you know, 
very, very much by myself over here. But it was kind of this beautiful thing because I was excelling in my career, but it did give me this opportunity to also express to others like, hey, this is my personality. Like I do have this perfectionistic thing. So when I'm pushing you to the next level or I am noticing really small details that nobody else is noticing, this is a gift that I have. And so don't take it as a criticism or she's so hard on me. It's others can look at this and they literally won't see it. And so there's also this this thing that I gave to to my team. I'm like, when you bring something to me, let me know, like, where is this at? And what do you want? What kind of feedback are you looking for from this? Because I can scour the things. I mean, outside of grammar, grammar has never been my strong suit. So I'm a perfectionist as much as I can be there, but I just, I <laughs> just, there's limits to my skills, right? I need, I have helpers for that. But with that being said, it really helped me to really work better with my team and help them to understand like, hey, if you do need these details, bring it over here because I can give them to you, but also give me that freedom. And the same thing, like you said, in other areas of my life, like with my husband, with my kids, even stress on myself. I know before we started the podcast, I was sharing with you a story about how once I figured this out, you know, I was away on a business trip. My family had decorated for Halloween and we always have these big fall parties and we were getting ready to have one. And I come home and literally on our nice dining room table, not the eating kitchen table, the nice dining room table, the fancy one, there are two vinyl tablecloths, but not only are there vinyl tablecloths on there, but they don't even match. One's like skeletons with like purples and blues and greens and the other one's pumpkins. (laughs) And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to leave it. I'm just going to say thank you. I'm going to leave it because I'm probably the only one that's even stressing about something like this. The reality is at this party, there might be one other person that even notices a detail like this. It's probably not very likely and it's probably not going to stress anybody out. And sure enough, the party was just fine. And that was just one of those moments where I actually could relax and I started to enjoy life a lot more. And so I just want to encourage people to, you know, whether it's taking an Enneagram test through, you know, going online and and Googling it, free Enneagram test or reading or listening to The Road Back to You to really dig into this conversation and figuring out which type you are, because I think it provides a lot of freedom. Yeah, absolutely. My first introduction, I actually heard the author, The Road Back to You, speak in person at a live conference I was at. Ian Morgan Crone is his name. And before that, I had heard these numbers tossed around just like most people. And I was like avoiding it. I'm like, that just seems really complicated. I'm happy with my disc assessment. Like I'm going to stay in this little bubble. And when I heard him speak, I was like, okay, the three other women I was with all ordered the book on the spot, like on their phones. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine. I will check this book out. And I was I'm like, this is fantastic. And it's so it took that. But what I tell people is you've got to read or listen to this book. You've got to kind of uncover who you are in Enneagram because it's really easy to take the test and I'm not going to say don't take it, but I've taken it multiple times and it comes out wrong because it depends on where you are because you get all of that wiggle room. Just like you were like, no, I'm actually a seven. It really pays off to read. And even in that book, the first chapter of every number as it's introducing it, there's like 20 things about that. And you can read that. And when you, when you read that and you go, oh, that's me. That's when you know. You don't even have to read the whole chapter. And you might read a couple of those pages and go, I mean, I can relate to some of these things. That sounds like me. I, I'm probably this one. Keep going because you haven't hit it yet because this it will nail you. <laughs> so yeah. why don't we run through like, what the different numbers are. Yeah, let's do that. But I want to just I want to just agree with what you just said. Like really truly, if you do go and do a free test, no problem, do that, but do read a book. Read the book. And the road back to you is great. Just read the book because not only is it going to help you identify yes, this is me and you you hear more of these thoughts, but if you know others that have taken the test and my whole team took the test and at church, I'm even in our prayer group and this was part of our leadership. We were taking these tests and understanding because it's not just understanding ourselves, it's understanding how others operate too and how they're thinking. Because when you can understand how others are thinking and how others are operating, now you can lead them better. You can work with them better. And so the book isn't just for you. It's actually to help you kind of work together with others. And I think God would want that for us. Yeah. And I'll add, there's a second book called The Path Between Us. And that one is all about, that was actually the the co-author wrote that one, Suzanne Beal. Uh-huh. And that one takes you through each number and how you interact with all the other numbers. Oh, and I love what, it. Yeah. What your conflicts are going to be, what your strengths are, who you get along with best, like who, who are your best friends? Who are the people who have been with you the longest? There's some fun stats you can look up just on like who each number tends to marry. 
but also it's very real. Like I've watched it happen in so many couples. I'm like, okay, that, that makes sense on the Enneagram that you guys are making it work that way. And then you've got people like my brother and sister-in-law who have the same number and they're both challengers. And we're like, somehow y'all have made it a real long time. Like good work. That was a lot of work. Wow, <laughs> and then absolutely. The, the other key thing with this is with other assessments, such as the DISC or Myers-Briggs and things, you can, it's really easy to put someone else in that box and to go, oh, you're obviously an I because you're fun loving and all the things. They warn you in the introduction of this book, do not do that because the Enneagram is not about all of your external features, all of your external things, your characteristics. It is all about your motivation, why you do the things that you do. And you can't pick that out of somebody else. You can't say, oh, clearly you do this because your greatest fear is X. You don't know that. I mean, I still dabble in that a little bit. I still like to th think I know somebody well enough to go, oh, I think you're this. But you have to be really careful to go, I think you might be this. Maybe we can talk about it. Maybe we can uncover it together and discuss it a little bit. But it's really important to not pin that on somebody and, and then start treating them that way because you don't know. And then the other thing is that your Enneagram comes from... <laughs> the ways that you were wounded as a child. <laughs> so that sounds like very traumatic and saying it that way, but it's really just what happened to you, what message came across that caused you to move in this direction. So you can't pick things out and go, oh, my kid is eight. They're definitely a one. You know, they're definitely a three. They're that performer. <laughs> my Again, my brother and sister-in-law, they joke about their kids. They're like, yeah, we're not done wounding them yet. So we don't know what number they are. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, how cute is that? Yeah. That so you've got to wait. Wow. Like, that's unique. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's somewhere that. between like 2025 20, is where you're kind of supposed to go. Okay. Now you're, you've gotten through this like bulk of, not bulk, but this portion of your life where it's guiding you into whatever that number is going to be. Whatever, you know, those foundational things you've, you've covered those. Now we can kind of right. look at it. Yeah. Wow. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to dig into what yeah, each number is and kind of numbers. give people? Yeah, because it can be frustrating if people don't understand what's going on. <laughs> Absolutely. So there's nine numbers on the Enneagram. And it's really helpful if you even just Google, you know, the Enneagram chart or graph. And my favorite one, if you're going to do something like that, you're going to get a circle, you're going to get all those numbers, but then they're going to have arrows all over the place. So number one is the perfectionist, the, the critic. And you know, it is really helpful as we, you know, when you've got that graph in front of you. So that's something that I would encourage people to, you know, just hop on Google and look up Enneagram graph or Enneagram chart, and you're going to come with a circle. And that's, you know, it's a circle because we've got everyone moving in different directions and everything based on where you are. So, and then I like the one best that has the arrows. So that'll show you, okay, the pointing here means I'm in health. Pointing here means I'm in stress. So again, that one is the the perfectionist, the the critic. And then they can have a wing of either the two, because that's next to them, or the nine. So when you say, you know, you have whatever number, you have, I'm an Enneagram, one wing two, or one wing nine. I have a lot of people who will take the test, and they'll be like, well, I'm a, I'm an Enneagram one wing seven. Like, that doesn't work. A wing is like next to you. <laughs> it's beside you. <laughs> and what it is, is because they tested like, you know, that was the next highest thing that they came up with, which would make sense for a one if your seven became their next highest thing, because that is something that the one is attached to, but it can't be your wing because it's across the circle from you. So I hope this makes sense listening to it. But like I said, <laughs> go look up the graph. Yeah, we will link it in the show notes too. So that way you guys can pull it up as you're listening. So I've already, already got a link ready to go. So we'll link it up. But no, that makes complete sense. Okay, cool. So then the two, the two is the helper, the nurturer. The two is this person who anticipates your needs. So you might not even have that need, but they're anticipating it and they're going to meet it before you even know that you had it. So That's they can have, yeah, you're one, two. Win. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one who like makes the biggest meal. Like they're feeding an army for three people because like you might want one of these things. Oh my gosh. That's you too, huh? <laughs> That is completely me. Yes. I'm always like, we're not going to have enough food. I got to make one more thing. And then it's like, yeah, or I'll make so much food and the people are still bringing stuff, but there's just so much. It's so much. Yes. yes. But You're I just... want everybody to have everything they need. Yeah. It's, it's like that Girl Scout mentality. Like we just had to be prepared for everything under the sun. This is the person with the Mary Poppins bag. You've got it all. Yep. Got that. <laughs> okay. The three is the achiever or the performer. This person is going to make sure everything looks like it's going great. And they're a rock star on top of the world all the time. This person can be 
a little bit showy in that. Like this is a person who has to have the right clothes and the right purse and the right car and the right job title and all those things. This person also knows people. This is this one has also been referred to as the chameleon. They almost don't know who they are because in any given situation, they will mesh into who that person is that they're dealing with. So they have to do a lot of soul work when they recognize these things and be very on alert when they're in different social settings and go, oh, am I being me or am I am I being that person? Am I taking on what they want me to be? What is going to serve them best because I want them to like me? So that's our three. Four is the the artist or the individualist. The four tends to hate the Enneagram because they think they are one of a kind. No one is like them ever anywhere in the universe. And so they read this and they go, oh my gosh, I'm known. Someone found me out and they kind of freak out about it. They are, they tend to be very extreme in their emotions. This is the person who is very happy to just like have a day in the dark and cry and, and they're happy about it. Well, the rest of the world is like, that's not normal. Like you're very depressed about something very, very small. That's how they function. This individualist, no one is like me. No one understands. And I'm going to stake my claim in that. I'm just going to own it. Yeah. I love how you're going through these. This is really great. And as you're listening, you may be thinking, well, that's me or that sounds like me or like, and so one of the important things to understand is even though like once you read the book, you will really be able to identify, Hey, this is me because so many of the questions that he asked, so many of the thoughts are going to be like, Oh yes, that's on point. But that's not to say that you won't have thoughts that all crossed all nine because you do typically, or from time to time, you may have a thought that falls into another category. And that's what I love too. This is more just about self-awareness than it is, like you said before, putting you into this box, being like, this is all you can be because you can clearly be something else too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And I'll kind of illustrate kind of how the, we can move in those different situations too as we move along. So the five is the thinker or the investigator. This person actually, they believe that they have this a limited amount of, a limited amount of energy. And so they preserve it. They have a limited amount of resources. So they're very careful with it. This person tends to be a night owl because they've made it to the end of the day and they still have reserves left over. Mm. This person tends to be introverted. And this is your researcher friend. This is the person who stereo in my car is not working. I need to find a way to fix it. So they get on Google and five hours later, they have gotten down to the rabbit hole of like where music began and came from. But, but the stereo is still busted in the car. Like <laughs> you went so far from what you needed to get to. So they, they're that researcher. They're going to find things out. This is the friend that has obscure knowledge on those things that they pull out. You're going, what, how, why would you know that? Why on earth would you need that information in your brain? That's your five. Your six is the loyalist, the skeptic. This is your person who is prepared and they're ready for the world to fall apart, but they have a good head on their shoulders. Like they, they're very skeptical of everything. This is the, okay, but how's that going to work? Why is it going to work that way? What are we going to do about it? They're very, very level headed. And as the loyalists, when they build a relationship, whether that be a friendship, a romantic relationship with a, with a business, with a, you know, whatever job they're in, they are the loyal ones. They are the ones who are going to be with you through thick and thin. And then you have the seventh. So this is the adventurer or the enthusiast. This is that person who is ready for anything all the time. Like they are the party just waiting to happen. They are up for whatever. They actually have a hard time committing to things. So if you invite this person to something, they're hesitant to commit because yours sounds fun. But what if something else more fun shows up and they, they need to go do that instead? So they don't want to like blow you off. But what if like in 10 minutes, something else comes up and I want to do that? This is, they're always thinking to ahead into what's next. This person lives in the future. The eight. Okay. Sorry. I was going to say, don't they tend to be very optimistic too? Like, yes, the seven avoids pain. They don't want to feel any of the feelings. So whereas the four wants to feel every feeling at its deepest level, <laughs> the seven wants to avoid all the feelings possible. The seven needs therapy. <laughs> <laughs> the eight is the challenger or the maverick. This is mine. I am the eight wing seven. The challenger is they don't necessarily need to control everything. They just need to control themselves. And this is a common misconception with the eight is this idea that they, they're a control freak. They need to be, you know, controlling every situation, but in a good place, an eight just needs to control themselves. Y'all can go do your thing. You can do it that way. That's fine. But if you try to make me do it that way, like it's not going to happen. Fat chance. And they tend to be, if you're going to go disc, those are going to be your D, your high D. They are, they're the leaders. They're the go-getters. They're going to, they are going to cause conflict because it makes them feel more alive. They're going to deal with confrontation when most people don't want to, because that's where they get excited. And that's where they build relationships. Whereas most people feel like confrontation is negative. The eight thrives on it. 
And then you've got the nine. This is the peacemaker, the mediator. The nine is somebody that can, they don't think their opinion matters. They hold back. Something in their childhood said, sit in the corner, do it, you know, do what everyone else is doing, go with the flow. Like your opinion doesn't, we don't take any stock in it. It's not to say the nine doesn't have an opinion, but, and for the most part, they're genuinely willing to just go with the flow and everything. But it's a spot where they can often be taken advantage of too. So the nine is very chill, laid back, but they need to, they need to step up and kind of assert their opinion when they have one and show people, I know I do have a voice. They're a very easy partner to have, whether that be in business or relationships. That's my husband. He's the number nine. Nice. And he's so you, lovely. You guys fit together well then. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's unique because we, we have a lot of these conversations. And so, and he's taken the Enneagram because when I do the assessments, he takes the assessments. So, you know, I'd want him to take the assessments and he doesn't need to take the assessments, but it, it's it's really unique because it's like, okay, that's who he is. He really is this, this peacemaker. And he, you know, he has the tendencies with the challenges. If he has a wing, that would be his wing more towards the challenger side, not the perfectionist side. So that's kind of like this unique thing because here he is like, hey, let's just make everything happy. He's trying to make me happy. And here I'm like, got to have it all right for it to be for me to be happy. <laughs> and so it's this very different thing, but he he tries. And so some of the things I have learned in our relationship is the fact that I have to express my happiness and not expect things to be perfect because I can actually put too much stress or pressure on him because he wants things to be happy. And if I make it too difficult, then it's almost just like just shut down. Like I'm just, if I can't succeed, I'm just not going to try at some point because why even try, you know, my efforts aren't going to be appreciated. And so that's one thing that I've had to learn over the years is how do I just be okay with things, even if it doesn't, feel okay inside. I'm trembling a little bit, but it, you know, one of the things that really helped is because even like loading the dishwasher, that's something like, you know, and I, maybe that's even in the book. If you rearrange the dishwasher, he might be a one. <laughs> and it's this unique thing because it's like, well, isn't there a right way to load the dishwasher? And it's like, well, yeah, there might be a right way to load the dishwasher. But at the end of the day, there's a goal. The goal is to have clean dishes. And so I quit caring about how the dishwasher was loaded. I used to load it this way. I used to be trying to teach people how, I mean, I had a system and a way to do everything <laughs> in my house. My poor children, I have apologized profusely to them. Like mom did not know she was so crazy, but literally there was a best way. I wanted to be super efficient. I wanted it to be done right. I, you know, anything worth doing is worth doing well and right and giving your best effort. But when I came to this thought of, okay, I'm going to quit telling my daughter how to load the dishwasher because the dishes that's been her chore. I'm like, I'm going to just tell her what it is I want. I want to have clean dishes. If you don't load the dishwasher properly or nobody loads the dishwasher properly, the dishes aren't going to be clean and that's going to cause you a problem. But my problem is not going to be how the dishwasher is loaded because I'm no longer going to care how it's loaded. And it was literally just this, because of this awareness, it could like lower the stress level in our home that I just thought was normal because being a one, and I think that's no matter what Enneagram type you figure out you are, you're going to realize you're probably doing things that affect others in a negative way. And, you know, it can be kind of a hard place to be, but at the same time, it's this really freeing place because it's like, now you can do something about it. And that's when I could just say, okay, I want the dishes to be clean. I'm no longer going to tell you how to load the dishwasher. That's just, this is the goal that we have. However you get there, you get there. And it really just opened me up to realizing there's many more ways to do things, even though, you know, you've heard that, like, there's more than one way to skin a cat. But at the same time, it's like, well, yeah, there is more than one way, but there is a better way. And so now I just like, and very much does it matter. And I'm just much more appreciative instead of like, oh, well, if I would have done this, this would have been 10% cleaner because the reality is we can't do everything. And the same thing happens at work. It's like, there would be times where I'm like, you know what? I'm not even going to give feedback. And I kind of would like gauge it. Like if I give feedback on this, how much better is it going to get? Because at the end of the day, we have to realize sometimes giving feedback to an employee doesn't actually help them. It actually hinders them from believing in themselves and believing that they're capable of doing something. And it causes them hesitation when they go to do future work. And so I came up with this like thing. I'm like, well, I'm only one opinion. Like, let's get other opinions or maybe get other opinions and then bring it to me. Or if something is far from perfect, either tell me that when we're getting started, hey, this is my 50%. Tell me what you need from this or 
have a few other people look at it before you bring it to me. Because as an executive, people are trying to bring me things that are pretty finalized. So yeah, and I think that's where the power of the Enneagram comes from is because you can't pinpoint necessarily what everybody else is going to be what okay, if this is how I am, how can I ask better questions? How can I set better expectations going into a meeting with, you know, a team member, an employee, whoever it is, and be able to say things like that, you know, what do you need from me in this meeting? What kind of critique are you looking for? What number draft is this? How can I help you? How can I serve you? And, you know, how can I lead you best today? Those kinds of things, because then it puts it back on them and you can meld to whatever they need. And the other thing with what you just said is it sounds like that, that release, that let go of the perfectionism is leaning into your nine. So you're normally a one wing two, but you have two wings. So your two is stronger, but as you get older, as you mature and in self-awareness, so it doesn't have to just be an age thing. A lot of times it is just how much you have you know, delved into this and how much of a, you know, how self-aware you are, your understanding, you can strengthen that other wing and be more balanced with everything. So you're leaning into having both of those wings be stronger than just the two. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because the other thing that I've seen happen, like in my relationship is this has opened up conversations. My husband and I were actually having a conversation the other day and we were watching Not Love is Blind. I like that show though. I like that show a lot. Uh, <laughs> what's the one with the, the, the kids with special needs that go on dates. I can't remember what it's called. It's on Netflix. Oh, I forget what it's called, but you, you probably know it or you could look it up. But the kids with disabilities. So our oldest has disabilities and so, or different abilities, the way I like to say it. And so watching this, you know, they're like doing things. And so it's, it's really fun watching dating shows with my husband, but somehow we got on this topic of making decisions. And he's like, well, you make all the decisions. And I'm like, I don't want to have to make all the decisions, right? Like, and so we got into this really fun conversations where he was like, yeah, I can see how you know, you having to decide all the time could actually be stressful and how nice it would be if something was set up for you that you didn't have to like <laughs> decide. Yes. And, and it's it's unique because I do have a lot of opinions. I can make decisions. That's who I am. I'm decisive. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, it would be nice if if it was like, hey, we're going here or I planned out this date or I've made these reservations or I did this thing. But just knowing the personalities, it's like, well, my husband just wants me to be happy. So when he's asking me where I want to go for dinner and he's okay with it, he's not doing that because he's <laughs> like, I can't make a decision. He literally is saying your happiness is more important to me. Like that's what actually brings me some joy. But he also realizes that it's not my fault that he doesn't decide where we go to dinner. And he could equally say, hey, I really want to have steak tonight and we can go and have steak. And yeah. so I, I don't make it easier though, because I have a gluten allergy <laughs> as well. So <laughs> food preferences and gluten allergies, it's like, I don't make it easy on them, but it's, it's just this unique thing because we can all grow. And so no matter where you identify on the scale, whether you're the peacemaker, you're the thinker, you're, you're these different types, you can really start to say, okay, well, look, I am this peacemaker. I am this person that doesn't make decisions and I'm doing this, but is this making me happy? Or do I feel like I have, you know, the other person is always in control. Do I feel like I have no control? Well, then, you know, I think we have to go back to self responsibility and say, okay, well, I've got to take some responsibility for this, I'm going to make some decisions. And that might feel uncomfortable. But just to Kind of, you know, it felt uncomfortable when I was inviting people to my home for this nice party. And here I am with two different tablecloths, <laughs> <laughs> my nice table. I'm like, ah. <laughs> but it, it works. Yeah. And you it know works. what? You can shift from work to home too. So you might be that hardcore one at work and then you get, this is my husband. He's that one at work. He's got his systems. He has his processes. Everything is just so. And then when he's done working and he comes downstairs, he's chill. He's like, let's party. Let's have a good time. He shifts right into that seven mode because that that's just where he is. When we, so when we were dating years and years ago, we went to DC for a day and we, we dated long distance. So we got to see each other for like a week every so often. So we got to go to DC for a day and he was like, giddy. And I was like, who are you right now? He's like, I don't know. Where do you want to go? I'm like, you're the one who reads the maps. You're the one who makes the plans. Like what's happening today? And I was so thrown off. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I'm not supposed to marry this guy. Like, I don't know what is happening here right now. And it wasn't until years later that we went, oh, you're a seven on vacation mode. You shifted into vacation mode and you were like, I'm just free as a bird. I'm just going to do whatever. And I did not know how to handle that. I was Oh, what's going on here? But it's fun to see that now when like when we go on vacation. 
and that that switch flips he's relaxed and chilled out and then what, what can we do what's going to be fun it's just kind of the after work on steroids so even you know your workplace can be maybe your workplace pushes you into that state of stress maybe you know and then you can get home and you can relax or are you in that state of stress and you're carrying it over into your home and maybe it's not your your primary number maybe it's not the three that's you know bugging your family it's that you're actually in this state of stress and you've shifted to to your um your one in that case or your two yeah because that's the thing all with all of the numbers none of them are bad like there's not a there's not a bad number like we can have a tendency to feel that way but there's not a bad number but th there are ways that we act when we're acting unhealthy which in all cases can be too much even if you're the optimistic person it's like well if you're too optimistic that's actually unhealthy for you and i'm not saying don't be optimistic i follow dr daniel amen a lot and one of the things he says is you know while it's good to have a positive outlook while it's good to be optimistic if there's no boundary to that then you put yourself in unsafe situations because you're like, well, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm totally good. I'm free. I'm just going to go do this thing. And then you're like in a really dangerous situation because you're so optimistic. And so having that healthy dose of, you know, so so there's healthy boundaries to kind of all of the, the things. But, you know, one yeah. thing you touched on earlier that I'd love to just discover a little bit more is you talked about the the childhood and how that affects it. Could you dive into that more? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to use my family as an example. So I'm the oldest of four kids. And my, my mom was with me when I heard him speak on the Enneagram. And so she was one of the ones sitting next to me. She's like, I have to have this book right now. <laughs> and then, and this was in October of that year. And then she proceeded to buy each family, each kid, their own copy. She's like, no, y'all need to understand this. <laughs> and some of my siblings kind of felt the way I did initially, like, I don't know what that thing is. And I was like, mom, they're not going to read it. They're not going to check it out. Now, I'm sure you've experienced this with your kids, but it's funny how, you know, you can all be raised in the same home by the same two parents and everybody is completely different. And we are a great example of this. So my dad is a one. My mom is a two. I'm an eight. And so I don't know. I don't know what the wounding thing was, but I need to take charge and always be in control of myself and don't don't tell me what to do. Maybe it's just, I don't know, maybe it's an older child thing too. My sister is a four. And the interesting thing there is that at eights and fours, they don't touch ever on the Enneagram in any way. If you look up how, if even in that second book, The Path Between Us, those are the two that are not going to be friends ever in any situation. If you're working with, if you're an eight and you're working with a four, like find a way out. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't going to work for the long term. So she, she's that individualist. My brother is the achiever. He's a three. And then the youngest is a five. So we're only missing, we're only missing two numbers on this or three numbers on this. <laughs> wow. Um, you got them all. We've got them all and we all enjoy each other. And we like each other. And so it's interesting to go, wow, what happened that we all grew up in the same house and we all are still friends that we can all be so different. So Christmas day, we all open these, these books <laughs> that she's bought for the other three siblings. And two of them were married at the time. So we've got three spouses in there as well. And I was like, guys, let's just read that first page of each chapter and figure out what everybody is. I kind of had a feeling not supposed to do that, but we read through them and my sister's the four. So it's, it can be kind of touchy on some of these things. And I was like, there's no way she's going to admit to this. There's no way she's going to do it. Well, she had her husband read the four. And as soon as he like halfway through, she goes, oh no, I'm so unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody said a word. We're like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen now? <laughs> like she could go either direction on that emotional spectrum. And, but it was really cool to see as a family for someone like my sister to go, oh, I'm recognizing this and I'm willing to say that in front of you and for us to all be able to have discussions around that. So I think it can be a really powerful thing when you've got, you know, when your family are adults, again, you can't mess with the kid thing, but being able to, how can we relate better? Now, now we understand why my mom does all the giving and over the top and things that she does. And there's seven suitcases when she comes to visit, and <laughs> but we, we can understand that we can get along better. So when it comes to like what, what the wound was in childhood, it's really what is going to spur what the greatest fear of that number is. So there was something in yours as that one that wasn't right. And it was up to you to make it right. The two felt like someone wasn't make, caring for their needs and it was their job to care for everyone else's. The three wasn't enough in some area. I am blanking on what the four was. 
some they, they just need that individual piece. It's like they felt lost in the crowd. So that that makes sense for a middle child. The five, there was an experience where they didn't know what they needed to know. They've got to go get all of the information. The six was unsafe somewhere. And now their mission is to make sure they are prepared and safe. The six is this person who has like the bunker in the mountains for when the world collapses. <laughs> It's, it's so fun to laugh at these. I know we're laughing and like you're saying things about your family and we're laughing and it's, it's, we can laugh because when you read yours, like you're going to be like, oh my God, you're going to laugh at yourself. Like that's really the opinion we should take at these things because it is just the self-awareness. It's not like, okay, this person's crazy because I love what you said and we'll get back to these childhood things. Yeah. This is really great. But how everybody in your family is different, but how we work together. And that's really the thing. Like if God created us all the same, how terrible would that be if we were all challengers? Like how challenging would that be? Or if we were all perfectionists, they'd be like, no, you do it this way. Like, no, you do it this way. Yeah. No, the right way to do it is this way. Well, did you know if you just do it this way, you could level that up by... <laughs> 2%. And so it would just be like this complete madness. So once we know it just like, oh, it's just such a fresh breath of air, because we cannot take ourselves so seriously, we can realize like, okay, yeah, in that area, I'm a little crazy. But there's also these areas that I've kind of been neglecting, perhaps, and it just helps us to kind of balance and not just put ourselves down, but really respect who we are and like lean into these strengths. Because I think that's a lot of times in our careers. And this is why, you know, I teach the promotion planning process I do, because I think we women really need to take control of their careers. And they really need to say, hey, this is what I'm good at. This is what I want to do. These are the ideas I have. These are the things we should do because people don't think of the same ways. And we have this tendency to think like, well, everybody thinks of this or they'll think of these ideas, but nobody is having this exact same Enneagram pattern that you have with your exact life experiences. And so that gives you this unique perspective that nobody else can have. And so you can think of things and whether you're poking holes in things or whether you're up leveling things. And so that's why it's just really important for us all to contribute and just to know like, hey, these are the things that I want to do. These are the projects that I want to be a part of. These are the because your boss really like if you've done no assessments and they really don't know anything about you because before doing this, I didn't really know about myself. So how could somebody else know about me if they also haven't understood these things, whether it's the disc and the Enneagram. And, you know, I recommend doing a lot of these things at work. I do the disc, the Enneagram, the Colby and the appreciation at work, because they all tell you something different, which really just helps you to work better with others, but really just, you know, it's okay to laugh at yourself. So if we're laughing, you're like, why are they laughing? This sounds terrible. It's because it's, this is the the best way I feel to really be able to harness this because you've got to be like, okay, yeah, I was a little bit crazy over there. How can I, how can I turn this yeah. around a little bit? Yeah. We can't okay. take this too seriously. Yeah. And if we just laugh with each other, then it's like, you know, it, it, it kind of takes the edge off. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't know the exact scripture, but it's like the head can't say like, I want to be the foot or the, the hand can't say, I want to be an ear. Like we, there's all these different parts of the body that have to work together. And that's what this is displaying for us. And, and right. but that's the key is learning how to work together in that. And our, yeah. the only thing we have control over is what we know about ourselves and then conducting it that appropriately with the people around us and communicating what our wants and desires are. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Going back to the childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The seven, the this fun loving party animal, they experienced pain that they don't want to deal with, right? They avoid pain. The eight experienced weakness or a lack of control over themselves. And then the nine experienced conflict that said, Okay, I just don't want any conflict ever. And so these what these wounds are end up translating into that number's greatest fear. So the one it translates into anger, the two having their needs met making sure their needs are met. If they meet everyone else's needs, maybe someone will meet theirs, even though they're really, really bad at communicating that. <laughs> I hear you. My, my mom is a number two and I love her. She is, she will give you the shirt off of her back. She is always helping other people. And that's the one thing I always express to her. I'm like, mom, you got to tell people what you need and what you want, because otherwise people just don't know. Like they really don't know. Like I know you want them to know, but they just don't. And it's, it's hard because she wants them to know, but it's like, we can't, we can't read minds and we think you're happy. We think everything's fine. So if you want something, just tell us. We're happy to do it for you. Your needs. Yes. <laughs> we want to meet your needs, but we have to, we have to know. Right. But that's understanding. I don't operate the same way as you do. So I need you to yeah. communicate it with me. My mom is a two. And she said to me not too long ago, she's like, but Kylie, I need to have this conversation with this person. We are having a conflict with a third party. And I was like, no, I'll reach out to her. And she's like, no, because sometimes you can just be so direct. And I just burst out laughing. I was like, I don't, I don't see the problem here. 
<laughs> I think that's what we need in this situation. She's like, no, it's just, you're just too direct. It's like, okay. <laughs> just those different perspectives. Well, that is such a good point you bring up right there with communication, because how many times have you been listening to somebody else's conversation and the way they respond to something or the way they say something and you've been like, why are they saying that if that way? And it's like, I know it's not just me as a perfectionist. I'm not the only one that's like, why did they say that that way? Or why did they do that? And it's like, but because we have a communication pattern that's consistent with the Enneagram, you know, even my husband, he's like, why do you have to give them all those details? Why do you have to give all that information? You talk way too much. <laughs> like, they, I know. And I'm like deleting half my text message. I'm like, just delete that. Okay, we'll be there. Like, you know, they don't need to know every reason for everything all the time. It's totally good. But it's, yes. it's, it's so unique because we communicate like that. And I think we can have these tendencies to be like, well, why do they do that? I don't know why they have to do that. And it's, I think that's where we can give people more grace. Right. Because when we know like, hey, they're operating in this way, this is just who they are. They're not trying to offend us. They don't think we're stupid because they're giving us to more information. They, you know, they don't they don't think that we are can, our mind readers because they don't give us the information. But well, all of the things that we say when people communicate with us, if we feel like they're they're failing at it. It's like, wow, if we could just have some more grace and just ask for what we need and appreciate them for who they are. Yeah. So I'm coming you brought up. Yeah. And coming at it from. Hey, it's sounding like you're saying X, Y, and Z, and it's, mm -hmm. it feels like this is what you're dealing with right now. Am I off on that? Being able to ask clarifying questions like that of somebody, because you can go, oh, shoot, like they're ticked off at me. Like, this is not, I, I don't know what I did to them. Just say that. Hey, it sounds like you're experiencing this and you have these kind of feelings towards me. What's going on? Can we clarify this a little bit? I'm not, I'm unclear on what I could have done better. You know, are you giving me these details because you feel like I'm not going to get the job done? You know, being able to just ask those kind of questions instead of immediately going to, they're ticked off at me. They hate me. They think I'm an idiot. We, we tend to immediately put those defenses up instead of stepping out of the situation and just asking questions and going, why? Why am I jumping to the defensive? But that's not where I need to be. I, I know who I am. I'm firm in that. I know I'm in this position that I need to be in. Let's just ask a couple of questions and air it all out. Uh oh, I love that. Because, you know, and that's what God tells us to do in the Bible, not to judge things. And that's what we do so often. We're just like, oh, well, they said this, like they think this about me or they think that, or they must think this or, and, and we could do it with everything. I recently, my son also has a gluten allergy and he was going to a base or a baseball party. He was going to a, a birthday party. And so whenever he gets it's invited, I always just let them know, hey, my he'll be there. My son has a gluten allergy. Just let me know what you guys are planning and I'll make sure that he has what he needs because I don't want anybody to have to go through that trouble. And oh my gosh, people go through all this trouble, do all this stuff. Well, his football game got can like canceled last weekend because of rain. And so it got moved. And so now he's got his championship games right when this birthday party is. Oh, so this mom messages me back and she's like, I found like, oh my gosh, just so amazing. Like I found this gluten-free thing and I found this and can he have this pizza and can he have this cupcake? And I was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. And my kid's not even going to be able to make it, but we do play against your son's team on Saturday in baseball. So <laughs> we'd love to get him a gift. What can we get him? You know, and, and she didn't respond to me. And, you know, my, I was like, yeah, I had to tell her, you know, we couldn't come. And I was like, I was telling my husband last night, I was like, yeah, she didn't respond to me. I said, she's probably just really busy. She's got a lot of stuff going on. But the old me would have been like, she's mad at me. She hates me. What's up? <laughs> like, like, what did I do? You know what I mean? I should have told her sooner, like all of the things. And, you know, sure enough, this morning, she messages me and she's like, I am so sorry. I responded to this in my head, but I forgot to hit send. And I'm like, no problem. That happens to me all the time. But I think so often in life, we stress out because we're assuming why other people are doing things, why other people are saying things, thinking that that means something about us, when in all actuality, it has so little to do with us and so much more to do with who they are as a person and just how they operate. But since we judge those situations, we put ourselves in a lot of stress. And so I think this tool is really great for helping us understand all these things. So Kylie, you do coaching. You don't just teach on the Enneagram. This is just a very tiny sliver. And I'm so grateful that you came here today. Why don't you talk a little bit more about your coaching and really like how do you use the Enneagram and other things like this with your clients? 
Yeah. So I'm an executive coach with a focus on goal setting and vision. And this is this has come from over 10 years of marriage and the things that we've accomplished because I have seen, you know, we, we've set this plan in place and said, these are the things that we want our life to look like. I want to love my life. I don't want to wake up getting frustrated with where I'm going or where it's not going and things like that. Like we, we're going to design a life that we love. And so we've done that and we've achieved a whole lot of things. And over the 10 years, as we talk about this with people, I realize they, they're not in that position or they didn't know to have the intentionality to set those things up at an earlier stage, or they feel stuck where they are right now. And so I have a seven step program. You know, I do small group coaching or one-on-one -on -one just to walk people through these seven steps of how do we really plan out what the vision is for your life and then look how do we set those goals? But the thing I like to pull in the Enneagram with is you've got to understand who you are and where you are before you set goals. Because it, it's really easy to set a goal because it sounds good or because it's what somebody else thinks you should do, or you just don't know how to make it you know, measurable or relevant. So you start getting input from other people and then suddenly it's not anything for you. It's not what you wanted to go after. It's not for the season of life you're in. Maybe you're that five and you have this you know, you don't have energy at the beginning of the day because you're saving it all because you're afraid it might all run out at some point, then let's set up your day better. Let's set up your goals that are going to cater to that. Let's understand who you are and therefore what we need to do to get to the place that you want to be. So that's kind of a little bit of what I do. I love that because, you know, a lot of times people try to put solutions. It's like a one size fits all, but it's like, that's not how it works. Even in business, I coach a lot of different business owners as well as women in their careers. And whenever it comes to business strategy, it's like, well, what is your business? What is your product? Is it physical? Is it coaching? Is it what, what is it that you're doing? Because depending on what you're doing and who you're doing it for, that's going to make it different. But then it's like, what do you really love? And what do you not love? Like there's some things as business owners that we have to step outside of ourselves and say, okay, I'm going to do this thing anyways, because it is part of what we need to do to be successful. But there's a lot of times where there's actually another way, which actually makes it way more enjoyable and helps the business to thrive because we're not going against the grain with such resistance. Cause like trying to tell somebody like, oh yeah, you got to go speak on these big stages. And they're like, no, speaking is not for me. It's like, well, that's okay, is there a different way that we could do that? Could it be on podcast where it's your voice or, you know, it, or do we have to do that at all? Is there a different way? But I think it, taking this into account is huge with that. So, well, Kylie, I know we're at time for today. It was so great to have you here. Is there anything that you wish that I would have asked you that we didn't get to today or any final words of wisdom? Nothing that you would have asked. I think just dig into no knowing who you are and let yourself out of the box a little bit. I think it's really easy to put these boundaries on ourselves. And one of my missions is just to help people live a limitless life. Like we're, let's take all, all the edges off and go, what is it that you want? You know, if you could wake up tomorrow being everything that you are in your head 10 years from now, what does that look like? And how can you take a step in that direction today? That's what I just mm. encourage people. I love that. I love that. Well, I think we'll have to have you back on for another episode where we talk about living your limitless life and taking those boundaries off. I think that's so beautiful. So Kylie, how can people connect with you? And I know you had a free gift for the listeners today. Yes. Yes. So on Instagram, Kylie N. Robinson, my free gift. Uh, yeah, I've got a PDF for you guys. It's uh, five steps to stop procrastinating and break down your goals. And you can find that at kylierobinson.com slash free. And I know you're going to pop that in the show notes too. Yep. We will put all that in the show notes. Kylie, I always like to ask my guest, who is the most influential woman mentor that you've had in your life? A mentor. This is a tough one. I've been thinking about it since you said it two hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's two people that come to mind first would be my mom, but then also this gal, she was a, a leader in a business I was in for 11 years. And it was her that taught me, <laughs> I can be harsh with my eight. I can be that challenger, but it was her influence that was all about how we, how do we serve people? If you keep that on that front burner all the time, forefront of your mind, then you can be successful in anything you want to do. And it's that influence that softened my eight enough to be able to tune into what do other people need from me? What can I do? How can I serve them? And sometimes that's not making the sale. Sometimes that is being there present for the person. So it'd be my mom and Janet Gooch. I love it. I love it. And I love hearing mom. That's why we keep asking the question. I know I've said this before, but we considered stopping because there were so many like my mom, my mom, my mom. But <laughs> I think women listening, a lot of us have younger children. Some of us don't, but it's always good to hear women, other women saying my mom, because as moms, we can be very hard on ourselves and we can think we're doing it all wrong. But I assure well, you, you are doing it right. Go ahead. 
Yeah. And th I think that's interesting because I bet everyone who has been on here has a mom with a different Enneagram number. Exactly. exactly. So you don't have to be a two to be a good mom. And I'll tell you, I struggled with that for a while. Before I had kids, I was like, I just am not going to be a good mom because I am not like her. And it took a long time and some soul searching to go, okay, a lot of other people are killing it at this and they're not the same as my mom. And I just need to own who I'm going to be in that. And so I think that's a good message for anyone listening to this and going, you know, I, I idolize my mom in these ways, but I'm not like that. That's okay. You are the one that your kids need wherever you are. Mm, exactly. God, God knew. God knew they needed you and that you needed them. So wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Kylie. It has been an absolute pleasure. And listeners, thank you for being here. We never take it for granted that you would spend your time here. Everything that Kylie mentioned will be in the show notes below. And until we meet again, I just want you to know that you're only one plan away from your next promotion. And God, he's not done with you. Hey friend, thank you for listening today. Be sure to join us next week for another great episode. If you receive value from today's show, I'd appreciate it if you would leave us a five-star review to help others learn about the show. And if you're ready to fast track your career and increase your income, impact, and joy, then head on over to maryjervich.com and check out the masterclass that teaches you how you can advance too. I'd love to hear from you. You can connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. This and so much more can be found in the show notes. I look forward to seeing you soon.